Hey, John, thanks for joining us today. And uh, we're talking about breaking growth barriers and Quest. You've actually gone through a couple of significant growth barriers. Let's go back in time a little bit. Um, uh, Quest was a smaller church in one season and you started to experience some growth. What were some of the key things that allowed you to continue to reach more people and see growth in your ministry? Yeah, that's a great question, Tony. And, uh, you know, I do have to go back a little bit to think about that. Uh, I, I do remember that time. Um, you know, when we were we were a church plant and we came out of another church, probably started with about 30, 40 people. Uh, some of those even went back to the to the home church uh, that launched us. But as we got going, you know, getting to about the 100 number and maybe 150, I remember the feelings and the stuff that was going on inside of me personally. And I also remember, you know, for my church, the efforts that we were making to really break through uh, that barrier of 100, 150 to the next level. Uh, I would say that key uh, for us was creating a culture of hospitality. Uh, I talk a lot about culture even now. Um, I would say that, that at the time, I'm not sure I really understood what culture was. To me, culture is a feeling. I think people understand that, how, how your church feels when people come in, uh, how the how the church feels when people encounter people from your church, when they're out in the community and that. So we talk a lot about that now, but I started speaking about that even back then uh, because, you know, I had a, a mission and a vision and cool back then pamphlets and brochures and, you know, creating the website <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But what we kind of quickly realized is without a culture of welcoming radical hospitality, we were going to struggle uh, to really make disciples and grow. So for us, I mean, the culture was huge and still is. Uh, it's different now. I can talk about that, too, if we talk about other barriers. But for us, that was just a major, major thing. And I say also with that. Uh, I think back and I go, kids, you know, making sure we had a focus on the next generation and specifically kids, even more than students, although we want to have a, a focus on students, we wanted to hit young families. And, you know, I remember we were meeting at one location when we got going before we had a facility and we just didn't have great kids areas. And so families would come in, you can kind of see them go, I, I like this, but I, where are my kids going to be? So, we had to very quickly start to focus on kids and the next generation, and that's become a huge deal for us as well. So those are a couple things. There are others, but um, if we want to dig into those or if you want me to share some others, happy to do so. Let me ask this. When you were kind of moving through that small church uh, to maybe midsize, if you will, um, how about your leadership? How did your leadership have to shift in that season? Do you recall? Yes, I you know, it depends on who you are, your personality types and, and the way you lead. I, I love people and I love to be with people and I want I want to be their pastor. Uh, what I very quickly realized, probably in the 200, 300 number, once we started getting to that, uh, it was when we started a second service, which is key, I think, to breaking that barrier as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I just realized I couldn't be everybody's pastor one on one. Um, and you can be everybody's pastor, but they know your name. You may not know theirs. And I had a hard time with that. One of the things we say at Quest even now is, um, you know, everybody wants to see everybody, including me. Uh, but we say it's just important that everybody be seen by somebody. So I don't I don't have to hmm. know everybody. I don't have to personally pastor everybody. Uh, I could do that with 100 people. I could go do the visits. I could be at the hospitals and things like that. Um, for me, that's rare now. Uh, so yeah, some of that you've got to be willing to, I think, adapt and change your leadership style. And I always have questioned mine, honestly, like, can I go to this next step? Can I go to this next phase? I like to ask my staff that, do you guys, you know, what are you seeing in me? How, how can, am I, am I leading well? That kind of thing I think is important as well. All right. So when we connected, you were actually trying to move from a large church to breaking that thousand barrier. And I know that was when our lives started to intersect a bit. Uh, and I had the opportunity to work with you and some of your team. So let's again, thinking back to some of those significant steps that you made as a ministry, as the church, what, what did you do in that season to continue to reach more people for Jesus? You know, that, I think that's a great question. And as I think back, there were some things, um, 
you know, we were, when I saw a cohort you were doing, it was called reaching a thousand. And that was our goal. I, I had on my wall, like a chart and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, so I was like, Hey, somebody, somebody mentioned you and what was going on and the cohort you were forming at the time. And I said, well, that's exactly what I want. I mean, I kind of feel stuck at this 400, 500, 600 number. We kind of fluctuated up and down some with that. And I, I need to know what it's going to take to reach a thousand. How do I need to change? What, what changes need to happen in our structure and, and systems became a big deal, which I can address as well um, at that point. So, you know, part of it for us was when we, during that time, Tony, we, we were, we moved into a building, a permanent facility. Um, we were in a rented facility before that. And so when we moved in the permanent facility, we jumped 200 people. We went from four to 600 immediately. Nothing changed. Same preacher. I didn't feel like my sermons were that much better. <laughs> I mean, why did we? This? Why? I think it was because we had a location and, and, and were more visible and people thought, all right, this is established. I'm going to keep going. Better kids facilities, all that kind of stuff. So that, though, wasn't going to keep us growing. You know, I knew, OK, we got to about 600 just because we entered this new facility and all of that, but and had a little bit more room. But how do we get to a thousand? And that's where we engaged, um, you know, your group. And, and I think consulting and coaching is really, really important. I'm still in that relationship with you and others uh, over all these years. Um, so, yeah, that is really, really important. Systems are huge. Systems can't be people at this point. You've got to move away from, you know, so-and-so does the Easter egg hunt. If you even do the Easter egg hunt still at this stage or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. the things that you do, you've got to be willing to move into systems. And I always, we teach that systems are, when, when you have a system, what is a system? A system is, uh, it's what we do, kind of why we do it and how we do it. So our systems are written down, they're in folders, all of that. They're reviewed every year by our executive pastor with the staff person who does it. There's job descriptions attached to it. So like our hospitality system has, I think it used to have nine, I think it has 12 job descriptions now from the person standing there waving when somebody rolls into the parking lot to the person that brings a new guest into the building, you know, all of those kinds of things. So systems are huge and we have them in every area, giving, kids, hospitality, worship, all of those things become a really big deal because you got to be able to hand it to somebody. People come and go. And so if, if the system leaves you, which is a person, you're in trouble. You've got to have something in place that somebody else can pick up and use. John, I remember too, one of the significant conversations we had was kind of around your leadership structure um, and specifically the addition of that executive pastor role that you mentioned a moment ago. So can you walk us through what that journey looked like for you? Sure. Well, it, funny story, sitting with y'all, we, we came in a few minutes late with y'all's Atlanta traffic. I'm not in Atlanta. So we, we were a little bit late <laughs> and uh, to, to the cohort and we sat down, we were all introducing ourselves. And I was there with a staff person, a connections pastor at the time. And everybody else was there with their executive pastor. And so my connections pastor, her name's Sarah, and I looked at each other and said, we, we got our first step. We need an executive pastor. What is that? <laughs> um, I came from a structure that uh, that's, you know, um, denominational structure, which we're no longer in. But I came from that structure uh, where that wasn't as um, big a deal, I would say. Uh, and And you didn't see it a lot, but we knew that we needed it because I felt like my span of care personally was too great at this point. I had nine or 10 staff. And um, so I hired an executive, that person at the table, Sarah is her name, became the executive pastor of our church. Uh, and then I was able to release uh, some of that span of care and it was a transition. I mean, we, we had to sit at the conference room table because every staff meeting was me leading it all that kind of, with all the staff. And then it became Sarah leading it. So, you know, you have to make that adjustment. But we have a great team and you gave me a great piece of advice, which was like, hey, if I wasn't your direct report, basically, who would you want it to be? And uh, they all told me Sarah, <laughs> you know, and so she, it that's worked right. out that, that she became our executive pastor. And that's been very helpful to me. And as you've been uh, bumping up over or two and over a thousand now, 
Yes. How, again, how has your leadership most significantly shifted in this season? I would say that it's interesting that the the challenges of growth are always, I, I guess it's always a challenge. And I'm guessing it's going to be a challenge at 1250, at 1500, at 2000. It just, there are different ways that it feels. And so, you know, this past week I, I preached a vision message at our church and I was thinking about that. And I was talking about growth and, you know, so often it's funny. People say, I don't want our church to change. I want it to remain small. I want it. And I'm going, well, they said that at a hundred. Now we say it at a thousand. I said Sunday to my folks, I said, I think when we say that, what we mean is I just want to be in relationship and connection with people. It's because if we want the church to remain small, we don't want God's church. Acts chapter two says in verse 47, the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. He wants his church to grow. Uh, and so I've had to really look out again uh, and, and realize I can't pastor everybody. Even at the level I, I was now, most of my pastoring now has to do with my staff and my some core leaders. We have a board um, leading them through spiritual exercises and things like that. But it is very difficult uh, at this point uh, to feel like you can pastor everybody. I feel like the best thing I can do, I, I tried to think, Tony, what is the best thing that uh, I can do right now? I think the best thing I can do is stand on the stage and share the word of God with people in an applicable way, relevant way, uh, and spend my time doing that. That's the way that I can pastor everyone, but I'm not going to be able to be in front of everyone in a one-on-one -on -one kind of way all the time. And that can be difficult. It, it's difficult for me. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if I can go to that next phase. In fact, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited to listen to the breaking a thousand uh, conversation because I, that's where I'm at and I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to adapt for whatever's next.